Technical stuff out of the way. Can you guys hear me okay? This is like, all right, very good. Um, so, really cool school you got here. You know, uh, uh, Cammie and I chatted about six months ago, I think, and that's where I got to meet James and just got to meet a lot of you and just seeing what this place is all about. You got a lot of great opportunity here, not just the instructors, but the equipment that you have, each other, and the network in which you guys live. Seattle is like a booming mecca for games. It's kind of crazy. I came out of LA, uh, mostly in the film world, and I had some friends who had worked at Valve, and they said, hey, you got to come check this out. And I did, and I was like, wow, cool area, cool company, I'm in. Um, so before I, you know, she said, oh, Cammie said, show something. I'm like, I don't know what to show. I don't, I, I, I'd go around and give a lot of talks, lectures, and stuff like that, but rather than break out one of the canned demos or, you know, this is how you do, you know, this or that. I thought this is a perfect opportunity for you guys uh, that I will talk, kind of piggyback enough of what James was just talking about. I call it a small world, uh, how the industry really works. I've been working professionally for over 30 years, crazy um, uh, to think that, but it's, uh, it's true and it's, uh, I've seen a lot. And I've, uh, a lot has happened to me. Um, I've seen a lot of friends go through a lot of things. So the one benefit I'd say of, of getting older is you do have that experience. There's not a lot of other benefits, but that's one. But before we get into that, I, I'll just show the, the reel. The, this is the reel that I put together about 10 years ago. I haven't put one together. Uh, it's long overdue. I need to do that at some point. Always keep current with reels. Bad example. Don't do as I do. So uh, this is the current reel that's out there right now. Nope, no sound. Uh-oh. Any ideas? Sound? Huh? I know you're a busy dog, but if you maybe we'd love to pitch you an idea for your show. Uh, maybe. I I know you're a busy dog, but if you've got a second, we'd love to pitch you an idea for your show. What's that? Okay. You want to just let me put that next to the the speaker? I could just put it next to. Uh, is it coming from there? Nope, it's coming from here somewhere. Uh, I don't know, it works. Tommy's got the spotlight. <coughs> Well, you know what? Yeah, it's gonna be. We might have to look at it. Yeah, we're just love the. This, you got to dance on your feet. All right, lights back up. So we're just gonna talk. So the thing, uh, if you want to check out the reel, go to mikebelzer.com. My son actually created the web page, and you can see my reel, my reels there. Because I also I started out in stop motion animation. Gumby was the first thing I did. Uh, um, gosh. See, part of my problem is I have so much in my head. It's like, ah, what do I want to get out first? So he was talking about reels, getting it out there, putting yourself out there, so incredibly important. I wish there was a video that I could show you uh, of myself back in your time right now. Because if I did, you would see a guy who's in the back of the class with his head on the desk, somebody like me coming around, would not get up, would not talk to him, would avoid it because I was so painfully shy. Different today, not sure what happened. Uh, actually, I know, my wife, and she really helped encourage me. And, but now, because the thing I had in me, and so those of you who are like that or similar, I know what it's, I know what it's like, I know what you feel, and the other thing that's inside you, most likely, if you're anything like me, I'm not saying this is exactly how everybody is, but you have stuff inside, you have questions. You have desires, you have ambition. You wouldn't be here unless you wanted to do this. So getting up and, and trying to act out now, it's only gonna help your cause. I know that's difficult. Public speaking, number one fear and all that. First time I ever did a public speaking thing, I froze. I was just, oh, literally, I couldn't, I, I literally could not speak. But 
you know, after doing a number of years, a number of things, it's just, it's fine. The thing that I, I have in, always in the back of my head, a captive audience like this, they're not here to heckle me. They're here to kind of, hey, hopefully listen to what I have to say. The one thing I'm, I'm, if you could take nothing else away, networking, being present, seizing the moment, it's so important because you're at the precipice of whatever it is that you're going to be doing. Uh, whether you launch into video games, visual effects, or maybe you don't. Maybe you have a career path that gets into something else and marketing or whatever. There's things you learn that the school is teaching you, but what you also are hopefully learning and working with each other is so key. And just seeing what I saw in here a little while ago where you're getting up, helping critique each other's work, that's awesome because that's so needed. We're all, humans need that human interaction. That's something that we all have, we all desire. So getting out there, putting it out there. The first reel that I put out there was through a connection at a school, I'll say similar but very different, nothing like yours. We had, we had a budget of about 20 bucks and it was a very small school. Uh, but there was a connection that I had through there that this guy knew, Art Cloakey, who was the founder of Gumby. He was gonna do a revival TV show in 1987. I wanted to do animation. I didn't draw, the computers weren't even on the scene yet, stop motion is what I did. So I thought, this is perfect. Man, I, I worked hard, I put something together and all that, and I put my reel together on a VHS videotape, that's what we did back then, and sent it on up, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And I finally got something back. <gasps> Opened up the package, it was my package, sent back to me, unopened. Not even a rejection letter. Talk about being crushed. And I was just like, okay, it's over. No, but fortunately I had an awesome teacher who just gave me a quick kick in the pants and said, get out there again, do it again. Uh, but uh, they, they returned, get, I don't care, do it again. Maybe I put a new resume together or something, I did something to color it up a little bit. And at least I got a response that time. And it took me about six months of pounding on that door that I finally, through persistence, and it's a fine line between persistence and pest. And I'm not gonna tell you which way to go because everybody's a little different. And it was that persistence though, that I was told, you're the last animator in. Boom, door shut behind me, yes, I'm in. And then they hired a few more after me, but you know, that's beside the point. They was told, this is it. But that was, that was the persistence. And I think that's the point that I started to realize okay, you really gotta put yourself out there. So the idea, the notion of putting out 10 a week or 10 a month, so key. Yeah, get out there, do it. I am shocked. I mean, graduation's coming and I'm seeing a spattering of hands. I don't know how many second years there are, but if there's second year and they wanna do this type of work, every one of those hands should have been raised. That's what you need to do. You need to get out there, you need to pound on those doors. Rejection sucks and you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's bogus. I've been in hiring positions time and time again. One company I was with, I, I made a mantra. It's like, no resume that comes in here will be unanswered. I, I just won't stand for that because I know what it's like on that other side. So even as hard as it was, thank you very much for your time, your consideration, blah, blah, blah. No, at least they know. You deserve that. But unfortunately, what you deserve and what you get are two different things. So you just gotta get that tough elephant skin and just say, you know, I'm gonna just keep trying, keep, keep going out there. So when I was at Disney, uh, I did a lot of different things at Disney. There for a while, uh, near the end, I was uh, animation supervisor. I, I managed the animation department. And one of the things I had to do was look through reels, look through resumes, hire people, hire interns. And let me tell you, when I see reels, and from an animation perspective, sorry, I kind of slant it, the talk in that way, because that's my forte is animation. Although I do other things, that's really my mainstay. So, but it can apply to anything that you do when you talk about resumes and reels and what, what work you're putting forth. But for an animator, you put basically a selection of your works together, hopefully on a, a computer and uh, you show it on a website, whatever, DVD maybe even. It's a little archaic, but it still happens, I'm sure. And I see reels that are like five minutes long. I, I saw a reel that uh, actually in an interview, this is a different company, but it was about, it was probably close to five minutes. And at the end he put like a, 
had to be another, it seemed like 20 minutes, it probably was only 30 seconds, short that he made like when he was in sixth grade or something. And it's just like, really? It was just like, no, that was such a turnoff because what you're doing by doing that is saying, I don't value your time, Mr. Interviewer. Look at my stuff. Value their time. Be short, be concise, let them ask for more. If they like what they see, they will ask for more if they don't see enough. Because if you keep it short and sweet, that's the stuff that pops off the page. That's the stuff that I'm like, wow, okay, this looks pretty solid. Now we need to talk further with this person. So one fellow, his name was Wayne, and he was a really, really good animator. And he did something I call motion doodles. In animation terms, what a motion doodle is, back in the old days, telephones, uh, weren't these cell phones, they were on these cords. And he had the character sitting down, talking on the phone, and with his other hand, he's just sort of playing with the cord like this or something. And it's just a motion doodle, it's what we do. But as an animator, that's a lot more work to do something like that versus like, hi, I'm on the phone talking to you. I'm gonna turn now and nod my head as I'm agreeing with what you're saying. And it's like, yeah, next. But that motion doodle, I was like, wow, this guy's really given a nice performance. Bottom line was, hey, we want this guy, he's gonna become uh, one of the interns, he comes into Disney, he hooks up with an animator, striving for a year's time, he gets an animator position. He didn't fail, he certainly did. He, he rose to the occasion, got better, uh, and he became a full-fledged animator. Now let's fast forward probably two or three years, a short period of time. You ever hear the old adage, you know, those who get you coffee today, you know, might be your boss tomorrow. So true. So here I am supervising the animation department, and now a few years later, the jobs kind of piggyback off each other. They said, hey, Mike, we don't have another soup spot for you, but we got an animator spot for you on Bolt, this animated movie. If you want to just jump and do some animation, I'm like, sweet. That'd be great. Just get back to the heart of it. And so I did that. Wayne became the supervising animator, the guy who leads the character for Bolt, the main dog. It was so awesome to see this, that this, this young guy who came through the ranks quickly, and this is, this is an aggressive, this is not, this is a Cinderella story, but the beauty that, that I sat there, and I'm so grateful I was nice to him, because he, he, was, uh, he was learning the supervisor role, and I was trying to help him see certain things, and times, you know, he's, no, no, it has to happen this way. It's like, hey, you're the boss, you know, whatever. But that same guy, had I been a, a tyrant of a guy or something, and it's like, well, you're a lowly little intern or something like this, because I see that with some individuals out in the industry, and it always blows my mind because it's a small little world. Had I been something like that, how do you think that situation would have worked when he's coming to check on my shot? Probably wouldn't have gone so well. So having that, that openness, that friendliness, that, that persistence, all that just being a good person kind of is, is what it really boils down to uh, is so, so important. Now, I'll talk about a different story. I went to a, a film festival one time, went with a recruiter from Disney, and so I was just like today, you know, walking around, meeting a lot of people and, and all this, and we had scheduled a period of time for a couple hours that I would look, sit down and look at people's reels. And you know, the rest of the time doing either talks, meeting people, whatever. And this one fellow, kudos to him for being persistent, came up, oh, hello, Mr. Belzer, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, yeah, take a moment, let's talk. And uh, he, but he was, at this point, he was getting to that pushy stage where it's just like, oh, I really want to show you my stuff. And it's like, well, you know, we're kind of going over here. Tell you what, at two o'clock, you know, we got this tent set up, uh, bring your stuff, love to look at it, and we could chat more about it, and it'd be a good time to talk. His next response was key, and I always remember it, and I bring it up as a good example. His response to me was, yeah, I'll see if I can make it. How do you think that makes me feel, the recruiter feel? Makes us feel about this big, right? So now if he's a mega talent, you know, may, I'm, I might very well consider, you know, looking at uh, if I was in the hiring position at that point and looking for people. But I'm already on the defense with this guy. So all because of, I'll say, an attitude or a, a way in which he presented himself. 
So what little things day to day that you say, you do, how you relate to people, it's a small world, they catch up. Another time I was in a, uh, a position where I was kind of in charge of a commercial group. There was about nine animators and I had to be the guy on top as well as animate, all, look at all these props and stuff coming in. It was for stop motion Pillsbury Doughboy commercials. And through that, the fellow making the props, who I, I had history with, he brought some stuff in and I'm like, hey, I want Norm, <laughs> I'll use his name. I said, it's not gonna work. And he said, uh, what do you mean it's not gonna work? And it's like, uh, for various reasons. And to that, from that moment on, he saw me and, you know, was I harsh in my delivery? Perhaps, I don't think so, that's not my nature. But he took offense to what I did. And from that moment on, I'll say, I kind of was blacklisted in this guy's, this guy's mind. And I was like, wow, this really sucks because I'm, all I'm doing, trying to do is my job. I'm just telling him this isn't gonna work in a nice way. He took offense to it, whatever. Fast forward, there's a job that a lot of my coworkers, fellow comrades, went to go do. I myself was like, oh, hey, there's the job to go to. I'm gonna go do that. Well, this one individual was kind of in a top position and that door was shut. No room for Mike in here. And I was just like, what? what? There's, there wasn't a whole lot of games going on in town, it seemed, but that's where the persistence comes in. It's like, okay, one door closes. There's gotta be another that's open. Looking around, looking around. I threw out, I don't know how many resumes and everything else. And there was this one little company, uh, Pixar. They, uh, they were over in the East Bay. They had done some cool commercials. They were making this kind of weird program render man or something. It was just a cool little startup. Went there and I was like, wow, this is really neat. Although I was just stop motion at that time. I wasn't computers at all. And John Lasseter was saying, well, we're making this cool little movie, Toy Story. You want to come on here? And I was uh, looking to say, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of in between things. Uh, I would love to, but you know, I, I, unfortunately, I'm committed to this thing in six months' time. To which he was like, well, we'd love to have you, but no, it's not going to work out. Darl Anderson said, who was in the commercial division, we'd love to get him. We'll train him. We'll keep him. Well, because of the delays that I was working for that six-month thing, that was a year and a half later, I ended up being at Pixar for a year and a half. All of this, why am I telling you this? The, the, the nuggets to pull out of this is the, the problem that I faced with the shut door, I could have got down. And I was, but I could have just stopped. I could have just pitied myself, but I didn't. Pull yourself up, look around. Found a company. I hated computers, right? I was a stop motion guy. Puppets, that's, that's the future. It's what I love to do ever since I was a kid. This computer thing, it's a fad. It's not gonna last. <laughs> Wait, we're taping this, right? Yeah, oh great. Um, so, but uh, trying to stay open, hearing myself, because I've always had this philosophy saying, well, Mike, that door is closed. Give this a go. Seems like a, an interesting company. And I did. It was a marvelous experience. Pixar was a tiny little company. I remember Ed Catmill came down, sat right next to me in my, my little cube. And I'm like, oh, hi, I'm a new hire, I'm Mike. He's like, oh, hi, uh, I'm Ed. I'm like, hi, what do you do here, Ed? Well, Ed Catmull, if you don't know, he's the president of Pixar, and he actually has his own math, Catmull. You know, this, this guy is just, those who know him, I'm, I found out after the fact who this guy was. Felt like a, you know what. And uh, so do your research, number one, you know, <laughs> when you go into a company, know, know some of the key people there. That would have been good for me to know. Um, but it was a good opportunity that I took. I seized the moment. I learned the computer, and I met some great people, some great contacts. So it's all about you know, connections. It's about knowledge. It's about talent. I never considered myself as a strong talent of an animator. In fact, one of the reels, and I was looking for it, unfortunately, good thing I didn't bring it, wouldn't have shown anyway, but it was like some of my earliest work, like probably not earliest, but I was like seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, something like that. And when I show that, 
I hear a sigh of relief in the audience because they're like, oh, God, all right, I thought this guy was something, but I could, I'm better than that because that's how good I was. I, I, I was not very good. And am I good today? I'm better than I was, but I'm not where I want to be. Always striving to do better. So just because you see, oh, Mike Belzer, he worked here, he worked Pixar and Disney and blah, Valve and yeah. Yeah, I've had, but it's that effort. It's that keeping it going. Keep trying. Make those connections. Keep improving your work. Honing your craft. These are the things that I focused on, and they have served me well. Now, it's not a guarantee. There is luck involved. There's that luck of connections and everything else. So these are things that I just, I, if nothing else, I'm hoping to instill in you, keep, keep at it. Because you're going to hit those walls. You're going to get those negative people that say you can't do it. You're going to get to some people that say you have no talent. If you believe in yourself, you keep it going. We're going to do Q&A in a, just a, a few minutes. And then from that, things will start to work for you. So the other aspect of the thing I wanted to mention about Pixar was people now, it's like, oh, you worked at Pixar. OK, if you knew Pixar the way I knew Pixar, it wasn't like, oh, let me in there. It was a cool little company, but it became what we all know Pixar to be. So that was a door. Many of my friends, actually, that were like, you're doing what, Mike? Nah, I'm going over here. That computer thing, nah. Pixar, pick, pick, pick what? Nah, I'm going to go over here. And afterwards, years later, people, friends of mine, looked at that and often said, that was a smart choice, Mike. You know, you, you, you did good there because it, it kind of led to different things. It's funny how, whether you call it God's will, karma, whatever your belief is, I do think there are things that happen for reasons, and I think there's paths that you choose. Last story I'm going to tell you is Valve. I gave a talk down in San Diego. I had a really good job opportunity in Utah that I was animation director or something on this film. They ran into financial difficulty, so we were on a hiatus. But uh, so I was doing some, some other work at Rhythm and Hughes to just pay the bills. So I was back in Los Angeles, and I gave a talk down in San Diego. Somebody wanted to say, come on down here. We're doing this big thing. Give a talk. And this fellow from Valve contacted me. And he said, hey, you should, you should come out afterwards. We're going to be over here at a pub. We'd love to chat it up with you. I said, oh, yeah, great, great. You know, listen to my own, my own thing, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. After the talk that day, it was late. I was tired. You know, because when you do a lot of public speaking, at least for me, you just kind of get drained because I just put it all out there. And when I'm giving a couple hour presentation, whatever, I'm, like, oh, I'm just, I'm drained. I'm talking to my wife on the phone. And it literally was a left and right decision. I, I was saying, yeah, these guys from Valve are talking. And it's like, I, I think I'm just going to go back to the hotel. I'm tired. You know, because I got this other job in the bank, right? They're still looking for funding, by the way. And I was like, you know, I'm really tired. And I, I love my wife dearly, because she, she, she just said, go talk to them. Just go check it out. Always worth checking out. Reaffirming what I know, what I know I should do, I'm like, all right. So I turned left. Instead of going right to my hotel, I went left. I met the guys at Valve. It was awesome. You know, take it from there. I'm still working there almost nine years later. Opportunities are there all around you that you don't even see as opportunities sometimes. The, the fellow classmate today that you might think is a bit annoying or something like that, he might be the soup that in five years' time you're going to be throwing a resume to and you don't want him looking at it or her saying, yeah, this guy was a real piece of work. No. You want, oh, that was a nice guy. Yeah, his, his stuff looks pretty good, or her stuff looks pretty good. Let's, let's have him come up. That's what you want. So be open. Keep trying. That's the thing I want to instill mostly with you today. Um, I do want to leave a little time here for questions that we have about a half hour. We got time? We got time? OK. So uh, reels and resumes, that's the other thing I wanted to, to talk and we talked a bit about it uh, already. So even this morning, I looked at a reel. Um, I'm looking at reels all the time. And it always amazes me. And 
this reel was pretty good. The, the work wasn't quite where it needed to be, and he was more of a, a student. In Valve, we tend to hire more seasoned people, so it wasn't a right fit. So, but I'm sending the mail, you know, so that person will get that response of saying thank you, but no thanks, because that's important. Um, but it amazes me when I sometimes get a, a resume, or uh, before the resume, the, the entry letter that basically says, hey, here's who I am, and it's pages, again, value the person's time on the other end. Put yourself in their shoes. You're not the only one they're looking at. They might have a stack like this to go through. They're going to appreciate something short, solid, and concise. So, but this case that I'm bringing up, long, didn't even have a real, it gave me a web link. So, all right, read the thing, looked at their four-page resume, and it's, you know, Oh, look at, look at all that I've done. Yeah, okay, you've worked at some cool places, yeah. I already feel myself getting a little on edge because I don't feel they're taking into account the time. But I will go to this web page, I go to the web page, and there is literally about 20, I didn't count them, but I'll say 20, different links of animations. A short, a this, but no real. So I just stopped at that point. And I, I was talking to another coworker, and I actually looked through one of them, and it was okay. But the consensus was across the board unanimous. It's just like, why are we wasting our time with this person? If they want the job here, they need to know, put something short and concise together. And by short and concise for animation, I'm talking two to three minutes of a reel. If you're, if you're a, a student and you don't have any real professional experience, one minute is fine. Because again, having people ask for more, that's a good thing. It's like the short that I watched today. You know, I was just telling Vic, I was like, wow, this is, I was here, what, a few months ago or when you guys were still working on it and it's like, oh, work in progress, can't see it. And it's short because I, I realize you guys only have so much time. But it was great. And I wanted more. I was just like, that's, that's one of the biggest compliments, right? When you get to see that, that, that short, and the audience is like, what, it's over? I want more. Same for reels. So give them something powerful and then leave them wanting more. That's OK. So going back to this person, we, we just was like, no, it's, it's not going to work. But I didn't send a, hey, no, thank you. It's like, hey, if you're interested, give us a reel of your best work. Because that's also showing me a self-editing, because sometimes I'll see Solid work, solid work, solid work. A student work, solid work. It's like, really, are you not able to discern the work? And, and I'm not saying student as in, oh, this was bad. I guess that's, it's, it's a, a earlier work that wasn't as solid as his other stuff. So the self-editing wasn't there to say, this is not as strong as these other pieces, but I love it. I'm going to put it in there anyway. And it kind of just comes off that way. And that's, that's a red flag, because I want to see somebody who can self-edit. People, you know, again, 30 years in the industry. When I put my resume together, and I redid it uh, not too long ago, because again, trying to keep it up, I need to do a new reel. And my reel is, I think, just at three minutes. Need to cut that down. Uh, but my resume was, I think it's on one page. I'm pretty sure it's on one page. And that's 30 years of experience crammed into one page. So how can I, with 30 years working at, not trying to brag, but something like a Rhythm and Hughes, uh, Skellington, Disney, Pixar, Valve, Warner Brothers, a lot of these cool places, put it onto one page? You can. It's, you just have to be creative and concise. Again, I'm putting myself in to the shoes of whoever's viewing this and just giving them a snapshot of who I am. Because if they have questions, they'll ask me. And that's what you need to think about. When you're putting your stuff out there, put your best foot forward, be concise, put yourself in their shoes, be respectful of their time, and say thank you very much. And hopefully, you're going to get a call back. And hopefully, you get an interview, and so on and so forth. So kind of with that, uh, one other thing I'll, I'll, I'll push right now is the networking aspect. There's something I'm part of called the Visual Effects Society. Uh, Visual Effects Society started in Los Angeles years and years ago. I've been part of it for a lot of years. 
and one of the main reasons was uh, at the end of the year you get these cool screeners, you know, the movies that are either in theaters or coming out, and I got a DVD of it and I get to watch it. So it was, it was kind of fun. Uh, so the Visual Effects Society is something I've always kind of been fun part of. They have a lot of social networking. They have uh, Q and A's, uh, like the next uh, uh, the Avenger movie that just came out. You know, might have a Q and A and stuff like that. So you get to go to these things and all that. It you have to be five years in the industry or longer. Uh, you have to have letters of accreditation. Blah 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 to get into the Visual Effects Society. We here in Washington just formed a chapter less than two years ago because we had enough people. We have, I think 50 was the number, or 40. We're, out, we're hovering right about 100 now, and we're continuing to grow. Uh, they needed board members. I stepped forward and said, sure, I'll help out for a little while. One of the things I'm on a mission is knowing, although it's been a while, I know what it was like to be in your shoes. Having community is key. So I've been reaching out to schools, and that's where I got to, to meet uh, you guys here. It's, it's, it's a community that you might not join the Visual Effects Society now because you don't have the experience, but <clears throat> if we have events that we're saying, hey, come on out, listen to what these speakers might have to say, and maybe do some networking afterwards, it's an opportunity. So we have an opportunity. Again, we're new up here, so we're just this is our first one. It's going to be kind of small. Uh, it's the end of the month, and we have three speakers that will talk five or 10 minutes and then some Q&A. And then afterwards, it's just sort of meeting people and talking. If anybody here is interested in going, I have flyers. Check it out. Uh, it, it costs five bucks to get through the door if you're not a member. So it's, it's, not, it's not much, but it's something to, to possibly do. I have a talk through the Visual Effects Society at the Civ Theater, as you know where that is, uh, for The Nightmare Before Christmas. This year is the 25th anniversary, crazy enough, so I've been doing a lot of talks on it. I'm going to do this, it's like an hour, 15 minute talk, all behind the scenes of the nightmare, and I think show the film uh, at the end of October. Same thing, I'll put something like this together and hit students up, say, hey, if you're interested, come on out. Again, it's hearing somebody talk about, and I realize stop motion might not be relevant, but there's, there's things about it that might be relevant. And it's a possible networking situation. You never know. So I'm not, I'm not trying to pimp this on you guys. I'm just offering up possible opportunities. Because I know the Visual Effects Society is new up here. We as a board are really pushing on, hey, community. So talking to this school, I'm talking to a uh, few other schools, just trying to get people like-minded to network. So again, you might meet somebody from a different school at an event like this that it's just like, hey, we got along really good, and this guy got a job, and oh, hey, I know that my buddy here, and hey, I got, that's how it works. A lot of times, that's how it works. So I uh, throw it out there as an opportunity. Uh, Cami also is going to throw out an email, I think, or something, because I gave it to her through that. Uh, and so with that, I thought we just ask a Q&A. Any questions? Yeah, there's one in the back. Good question. So the question is, if, if I have a disorder, you know, how is that affecting my, my chances of getting into the job? Would that be a fair nutshell? Um, I would imagine for some it might be something, but I, would, I know many, I know many people who, who have disorders. Programming is, pro, my son is a programmer, and he, uh, uh, he, his sensibilities, how he interacts with people and stuff, it's different than how I interact with people. And it's, uh, it's something that I, uh, I've come to understand in working with programmers especially, that uh, it's just a different class of people than, than an artist. Artists are freaks and weird and all this kind of thing. Programmers tend to be uh, these, these uh, introverts who just kind of get lost in their own world. That's a total stereotype because I know 
I have a programmer friend who's even more boisterous than I am. So it's across the board. Does it affect your chances is your question. I would say if you're talented and you have the chops to do what is needed, no. At the right company, at the right company, no. There might be a company with a real piece of work that you know, has a problem with the way you dress, the way you look, uh, you know, color, sexual orientation, which should not and cannot be, but hey, maybe people have these problems. I don't know. Maybe they do, and they say no. But I know many people that they look at the talent. And if they have the talent and they have the drive, that's the person I want working on the team. It's a good point, too, that I want to bring up is the drive. So when I was hiring, too, uh, I did a lot of hiring on the uh, Meet the Robinsons uh, film at Disney. And I came across a number of people that were talented animators. And I saw some animators who weren't so talented. I remember specifically two people, one that was more talented than this other person, but this other person impressed the hell out of me at their tenaciousness, at what they said they would be willing to do. Mike, I just need a chance. I, you need me to work a weekend? You know, why, I, you know, basically the person who's gonna crawl over that cut glass to get that thing out the door, right? And when you're in production, and especially at crunch time, that's the person that I want. So the thing I know going through my years, training somebody to give a damn, training somebody to have the gumption to crawl over that glass or whatever, you can't train that. That's either in them or not. The talent, that could be trained. To different levels, I think everybody has, again, I, I put myself in the, I'll say average category. There are definitely animators much more talented than I. But I will peg myself against any animator who says that they're more driven than me. They're not gonna win. We might tie, but they're not gonna win because I try hard. I work late. I do first in, last out. Whatever it takes, I'm there. I wanna do it. That's how I got where I was. So the talent, that, that's so key. So having the talent, but the drive, having the drive and giving a damn and giving them what they wanna see, that's important. And not just giving them lip service, because if that's not you right now, I'm not saying, oh, game over, you can't do it. But you might reevaluate your priorities. You might think, you know, yeah, I've been a little lax. I need to kind of push on this or step it up, push up my game. Because look behind you, there's 20 people vying for that same job. So, you know, really push for it. Hopefully that answers you. Yeah. What was my favorite part working on Nightmare Before Christmas? Um, gosh. Walking into the sets every day, because just like this where we have these black curtains and everything, they, all the sets were cornered off like this, and a set might be about half this room with black curtains. And you open up those curtains to go to work, and all the lights are lit with all this color and these sets. I got the best job. I played with G.I. Joes as a kid. I love that. I got lost in my world of G.I. Joes in the dirt. And now they're paying me to do it frame by frame. And it was so cool. I got to go play with the best dolls in the world, on the best sets in the world, and the best lighting, and make a cool movie. So that, I think, was the best thing. Walking into those magical worlds and showing people that was, was a lot of fun. Yeah. So like my 10-year plan is that I want to work for Valve. Uh, but I'm not quite there yet. So I was kind of wondering um, what Valve is looking for in uh, the terms of portfolio development, like character, uh, the character pipeline, rigging, animating, and if there's um, some sort of, uh, I don't know, kind of style, because Valve works on multiple games, CSGO, you got Team Fortress 2 and Dota. So is there kind of like a meet in the middle? Because I've looked at some uh, portfolios of Valve employees, and they, they have a mixture of like uh, PBR workflow and uh, uh, hand painting styles. So I was kind of wondering um, what I would want to shoot for to develop my portfolio for Valve. So the question is, what do I do to get my portfolio up for a Valve review to get into Valve eventually? Um, don't style your work to the company. Do what you do best and put that forward. Because it's your work. That's, that's your passion. That's what we need to see. 
Valve, the, the tagline, and it's true, what Valve hires for is we want smart people to do smart things in a smart way that benefits our community. By, by happenstance, for me, it's, well, if I do some cool animation, I'm kind of doing that. If I'm thinking about what I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. So we're, we're not looking at do this, make this style. Oh, you know that game? Make it art like that. No. Now, there are, because we don't fill what, what I call butts and seats. We don't hire for a job or a game. We just want smart people that can benefit the company and our community. So there are other companies out there, though, that, hey, we have this job, this game coming up, whatever. So we're looking for this style. OK, so curtailing your work to something that they know, that you know that they're looking for, that is important, OK? So when I sent out reels and stuff, I didn't send out a reel, the same reel to Valve, which is a game company, to Rhythm and Hues, which is a visual effects company, to a Disney, which is a film company. It, I had different reels for different venues. Research the company, know what you're going after, and that's what you're doing now. But I'm saying for Valve, it's not about you know specific art style. It's more who you are. Okay, that's okay? good to hear. The question? Yes. Uh, I was looking through your resume, uh, not to be creepy, but uh, I saw you worked something from MTV. What were those things that you did for MTV? <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> I saw like early '90s stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, I remember when. Um, gosh, what did I? I did a, a few things. The one, the one that just flashed into my mind was soap opera. Okay. Yeah. Soap opera was a stop motion TV show that we cranked out. Uh, by comparison, uh, for animation, Gumby, I did, uh, I think it was about 10 seconds, 7 to 10 seconds a day. And that was cranking it out, right? Um, for film, you know, like a, a film like Nightmare or something like that, it might be closer to, you know, 20 seconds in a week or something. Soap opera, I probably shot about a minute and a half in a day. The thing was so fast, and it basically was these bars of soap that, you know, with bad corny dialogue, you know, oh, hi, Mike, and it was a microphone, the soap microphone with the rope or soap on a rope, and one Neutrogena with the pump, it's like, oh, you, you have a big pump there, and it was just these <laughs> bad lines, and I'm like, really? It's like, oh, but it's classically bad. It's going to be great, and we cranked through a number of those things, so that was one of the things. Thanks for bringing that up, and, you know, we live in the trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, celebrity deathmatch. No, that was uh, I, uh, that wasn't that was not uh, that might have started through MTV. But no, I did not work on any of that. There, there was a company I'm blanking on it right now in the Los Angeles area that continues to do that kind of stuff. And yeah, Ro Robot Chicken. Yeah. I think? Yeah. Um, what about yeah. when you're What about when you're working on something like Nightmare that's that's awesome and you're, and you're and you walk into that room and you're like, oh, this is the best job ever? Versus like soap opera or I can't imagine Pillsbury Doughboy has the same. Like, how do, how do you how do you dig in on something? Oh, you just got to have fun with it, right? You just uh, it's still the craft. And with stop motion, you know, you basically are come to the nightmare talk and you'll see. But you know, you'll be positioning the puppet and you know checking things and position it. Might take anywhere from ten seconds to you know could be a half hour, and then you take a frame. 24 frames, you get one second. With soap opera, it was like, somebody else has the clicker, it's like, go, 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 <laughs> go. I kid you not, it was that fast. Sometimes I think my hand was actually in the frame. It was like, okay. So it was just sort of like, well, let's just have fun with it. Um, best, one of the best jobs was a commercial for Heineken. It was very low budget, and usually they have food stylists and stuff come out, and they you know, special cheeses and everything. Well, Heineken, these bottle caps had to just uh, come alive on a, on a sweep. And we're like, well, do you have the bottle caps, the pristine bottle caps that you want to shoot? And they're just like, yeah, no, because it was, it was a different country. It wasn't the, the United States. And it's like, yeah, no, just go buy some beer and take it out of petty cash. And so me and a couple of stagehands got a couple of cases of Heineken. We're popping the beer caps off. You know, it's like, oh, that one's a little too bent and just, Drinking away, popping another. Oh, that's a good one. 
And let's just say that day was a total wash. It was, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, though. And we got all the bottle caps we need. We didn't shoot that day. The following day, a little slower, and then we got better. So, yeah. Great questions. When I was at Pixar, how did I learn computers? Did I, was I in a class or something? No, because Pixar, in fact, I, I can't prove this. Um, they have a, something called the Pixar University. Um, I think I started that because I, I was one of the first hires that they basically were like, okay, this guy knows nothing about computers. He doesn't know what a mouse is. And so, yeah, there was nobody. It was a lot of, a lot of struggle, a lot of communication with others. And I wrote a lot of notes. And then when I left, I put those notes in a kind of a form, and I passed them along to the new hires that were coming in for, was it Toy Story? It might have been Toy Story 2 at that time. Um, anyway, the, at that point, Pixar had started to gain a little momentum. And I, so I gave those notes, and they started utilizing those notes to teach others. And then P Pixar University you know, became it, its, its thing. Well, yeah, they won't tell you that, but I, I, but I do remember somebody came in, a programmer came in, and I'm just like, hi, I'm Mike, I'm, I'm new here, and I, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's like, yeah. And they're just, I said, what do you do here? Oh, I'm a programmer. And I'm like, oh, okay. Any, any suggestions, you know, to how to learn this stuff? He says, C++, learn C++. <laughs> I'm like, C++. I go to, the, go to Barnes & Noble or something, I get this book, C++, open it read about the first quarter of the page. Because that half of the brain just doesn't work, OK? Not for me. <laughs> I know some of you, it totally works. The art side is the one that works for me. I could take that thing, throw it in the Pacific, and there would be no water. It was so dry. It was, <laughs> oh god. But then I had somebody who gave me the best piece of advice that I could ever I could give back. And he said, Mike, you don't need to learn C++. You're an animator. If you know it, great, but you don't need to know it. Nobody here knows everything. Find out what you're good at, hone in on that craft, and grow from there. And I was like, ah, oh. the, the anvil that was taken off my shoulders at that point was huge. Because it was at that point I realized, OK, I know animation. I'm not sure how to do it in this animation program, because it was like an Excel spreadsheet. It was bleh. and. Uh, but I, I, I got the niche of it. I, I got the, the knack of it, and I, I started doing all right. Um, but it was just growing from there. So don't, you don't have to know it all. But knowing more is helpful, but you don't have to know it all. Yeah. Oh, back there. Yep. Lies! What were the struggles working on Dinosaur at Disney? Um, that was our first computer m movie that we made. There was some computer, like Fantasia 2000 had some computer effects and stuff like that. Uh, so there was a computer division that was being created. Uh, one of the biggest problems with Dinosaur was we basically made two movies because it, it uh, went through rewrites and everything else. So it took a long time. Um, and we were learning as we were going with computer programs. We used Soft Image for the body and a program called Maya, Maya, Maya. It was like Maya and Beta <laughs> for the facial. And uh, Mayo, that was it. And uh, it was merging those things. So it was a lot of exploration, a lot of learning as we were going, a lot of tools being created. And it, it, so what did we learn? I mean, we learned just keep moving forward, right? Just don't stop. Keep uh, developing your tool sets and learning things. And um, does that? Does that answer? OK. Nice catch. <laughs> yes. So I've been looking at uh, the training programs for Pixar, Disney, DreamWorks. Uh, uh, what d makes me slightly worried is uh, for Disney's uh, Amir, it's like the first thing they put in there is acting, acting, acting. And I 
haven't. I'm I'm expressive, but I haven't taken any acting classes, hmm. so I get very worried. Like I I I practiced animation before. I'm mostly a rigger, hmm. but I do want to learn the uh, in depth animation. I'm wondering how it, how steep are these trainee entry levels because they are pretty vague and they make it sound a little intimidating. So how steep is the curve to get into animation programs like uh, Disney, DreamWorks, and such? Uh, it's a very, it's a constant moving target. It's very different today than it was when I started uh, or when I was in the, in charge of bringing interns in and stuff. Uh, it's probably harder today, honestly, because there's more people, right? More schools, more, the competition is, is raised up. That's not to say, oh, I can't do it now. No, you still can. But doing the research like you're doing, it, it talks about acting, as you say. So what can you do about acting? Again, I always, in my younger professional career, still very painfully shy, uh, I always said I was an actor, uh, a painfully shy actor that hid behind my puppets. And that's true, because I was able to express myself through my animation. Um, today, it's not to say somebody who's like that can't survive, but it, you, you, you're behind the curve, right? Because to get up and act something out is difficult in front of people, uh, but sometimes you might have to do that, or you're in a tight space. Where I work right now, I have a desk, and there's people all around me. I get up, and I'm working on this game called CSGO with guns and stuff, and I'm, I'm like doing this kind of thing, and people, programmers are looking at me like moving aside, like, is he having a seizure? What's going on? <laughs> but I got my little iPhone, and I'm doing videos of myself, doing whatever, because I have to get up and act it out. Practicing, doing, taking improv classes. Again, is that do I really need that? No, but there's things from it. I've taken improv too, that you just, it's more information, it's more power. It's, it's good stuff to learn. A great book out there from a great uh, uh, writer called, his name is Ed Hooks. He wrote Acting for Animators and he's had several publications afterwards and he gives, he's now living in Portugal. But uh, I've been to, and I've brought him out to numerous, I brought him to Valve, I brought him to Disney, he gives these lectures and stuff. And it's great because he, he, he's an actor who was brought in on the movie Ants way back in the day. PDI did this movie called Ants. And one of the animators, I think, uh, knew Ed because he was kind of an actor as well. And it's like, oh, Ed, you should come out and talk to the animators about acting. And he did. And he's like, oh, this is easy. And he realized real quickly, it's like, man, they're, they're kind of weird, these, these animator guys. They're not, because they're not actors, not in the classic sense. And somebody pulled them aside and was like, yeah, Ed, I uh, don't know how to tell you this, but you're kind of sucking, and I uh, don't know if this is going to work out so well. And that was the, the wake up for him, to say, oh my gosh, this is a different breed of an actor. So he has put his career, stopped acting basically, and teaching acting, and is more focused on acting for animators and get his newsletter if you if you don't already know of ed hooks uh fantastic guy read the book it's just wonderful good stuff to learn from him so going back to your question do you need all that more more the better right that's that's what you need just delving in diving in and are you are you going to be to that point where i am prepared no you'll never be but you're going to be as prepared as you can be and that's what you're shooting for and hopefully your work is strong enough and their need is, is great enough that those two things line up and you get a chance. Yep. Did you do any of those cool knife tricks in CSGO? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is like a really weird question, but did you work on the Gumby movie? Ah. Gosh, that's a good question. Never been asked that. Yes, I did. Um, I quit. Uh, uh, on the Gumby movie. <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, well, I, I struggled, in, you know, I was young and pompous in, in a sense, I think. Uh, I had finished the Gumby series and I didn't think I was all that, but I knew what I wanted to be. And Gumby was, remember that thing of what I was telling you about was the soap opera thing? Art Cloakie, God rest his soul, he was just a wonderful man and I owe him so much. But he also knew, hey, this is just a TV show. You know, it's not, Nightmare was after, so you couldn't, you know, say it's not Nightmare, but it's not a movie like Nightmare. It's a TV show. Just, it, 
faster, faster, faster. And I wanted quality. And so when I went to the Gumby movie after, um, it was that same kind of thing, faster, faster, faster. And I'm like, this is not sitting well with me. I feel like I'm, you know, maybe that brooding artist, oh, I'm losing my soul. And I just said, I, Art, I, I have to go. You know, this isn't working for me. And I, I left after a, a period of time. I can't remember even how long I was on it. But uh, uh, through that, I, I found, and I didn't have a job to go to. I was, I, it was kind of that, what, what do I do now? And it was maybe not the smartest choice. Uh, but I, I landed on my feet down the road. It did take a while. Um, but it was, in hindsight, I probably should have finished that because it would have been yet another mark uh, that I could definitely add to the resume. Um, and yeah, so, done. Cammie. I'm sorry, we only have a, we're ra rounding up the sure. clock, but I have one question that comes from wearing my hat. We're very lucky to live in a city with a bunch of startups and a ton of awesome indie uh, studios. Can you give us some advice on taking, as you're coming out of school, taking projects that you may not get paid for? Take, taking projects what? That you may not be paid for. Oh. So, you know, if you're not working, I get requests from you know, startups. Do you have any students that would work for nothing? Absolutely. That can yes. animate for us? So I'll give, you, I'll give you a story to that. The, the question is, there's a lot of startups here. Can you give us a direction as to should basically jobs be taken when you're starting out for no money and whatnot? Um, yes, is my answer to that. It's, it's difficult. Uh, paying jobs are better. I'm the first to agree with that, yes. But when you don't have one, uh, opportunity of what you could get for showing more work, meeting more people, that's a positive thing. Case in point, Anthony Scott, who I worked with, he and I were the last, on the same day we were both told, you're the last animator hired on Gumby. He was developing after uh, years, maybe this, I think this was right around that time about the Gumby movie. He wanted to develop a children's TV show um, that was gonna be faith-based and it was like, oh, this is really awesome and I, I really loved it. And so I thought this is gonna be fun. And so there was no money. So, but I spent, he, he did a lot of the sets and everything, and I did the animation for this thing. And I worked for free for, uh, it was less than six months, but it was several months that I, I worked every day going to his garage, we, and it was a great experience. And it was just Anthony and me. But what that did was shortly thereafter, Anthony got a job with this guy named Henry Selleck on some MTV stuff. Henry saw the work I did on the short, and he said, hey, if I get some more work, I want that guy working with me. Oh, I got Pillsbury Doughboy commercials. Hey, let's get that Belzer guy. Boom, boom, boom. See how it can work? It's opportunity. So yeah, that, and again, does it always work like that? I can't, no, but it's, don't turn it away. Don't, don't, the one thing I always tell students is some have this dream of, I'm gonna work at Pixar and that's it, or Disney or whatever. It's like, that's a great goal. And if you get in there, awesome. But don't keep knocking on that door as other things keep coming and say, no, no, I'm going to get in here. Because those things you're shooing away could have been that tumbleberry tale with Henry Selleck or the, uh, the Nightmare or Pixar, Little Company. Yeah, 